Now let's look at the action of the projective camera on points. We'll first consider forward projection, and this is a, just a simple mapping as what we have seen earlier on. Given a point in 3D space that we represent by capital X over here, the, the action by the projective camera, it's simply the multiplication of the projection matrix represented by P and X, and this would uh, map the 3D point onto a 2D image coordinate given by small x over here. So effectively, what we are doing here is that we are transforming a point in the P3 space onto a P2 space. And this works for any general point x. In the case where x here, it's a vanishing point or a point at infinity, which we denote by d, the camera projection will work the same, or the point at infinity, which you denote by D, uh, where the first three elements here denotes the direction of the point at infinity, and the last element of capital D here, it's going to be zero because this is an ideal that lies at the plane of infinity. And applying the same camera projection matrix action onto the point at infinity, we'll see that this becomes P multiplied by D, where interestingly, only the first three by three elements of the projection matrix will act on D. That's because the last element of D here is zero. Uh, the last column uh, will have no effect of the point at infinity. And effectively, what we get here would be M multiplied by D. This means that the first three by three elements of the camera projection matrix would only have uh, effect on the point at infinity. So this guy here, it's actually the vanishing point. Now let's look at the effect of camera projection on the point in the opposite direction, where now suppose that we are given an image with an observed point. If we know the camera uh, projection matrix, that's P. So we ask the question, what would be the effect of the camera projection matrix on this observed point, that which we denote by small x on the image? So a point that is being projected onto the image, it's, it would never be possible to recover the exact location of this 3D point. The reason is because the camera projection matrix is a 3 by 4 matrix, which is actually less than full rank. Less than uh, full rank. What this means is that the forward projection x equals to px is possible, but since p is uh, less than full rank, it means that p is a non-invertible which means that the X, capital X, which is the 3D point, is never, we are never able to recover it in the exact form by simply doing this. This is because the inverse of P does not exist. But as a result, what we can get would be one family of solution, uh, which is essentially the camera, the uh, family of solution that lies on this light ray that passes through the point X as well as the 3D point uh, capital X over here. And uh, of course, this light ray has to meet at the camera center because this is a projective camera with a central projection. So what it means is that the, the, the 3D point that we can obtain by doing back projection would be equivalent to a line where this particular 3D point can lie anywhere on the line. So geometrically, we can see very clearly from this illustration over here, any point on this line would actually be projected onto the exact same point onto the, onto the 2D image by the camera projection matrix P. So this line is actually spanned by two uh, parameters. The first one would of course be the camera center, which is written here. And the second would be any point that lies on this line, or conveniently, we can actually express the ideal point or the direction that is pointed uh, from the camera center to the, this observed point on the image. You'll see that that can be found by uh, multiplying the pseudo inverse of uh, P with the 
camera coordinate point x. This guy is the pseudo inverse, which is actually given by this equation uh, over here. And effectively, we can see that applying the pseudo inverse on x, this is actually an ideal point where the last element is zero. This simply means that I have an image and I observe this point x on the image. And I know the camera center, I'm actually finding this direction that points from the camera center toward this uh, 2D camera coordinate to the infinity. And this can be effectively found by multiplying the pseudo inverse of P with X. And we can actually verify this, that the result of this is actually equals to M uh, inverse multiplied by X by simply pre-multiplying this guy here with uh, P again. So we can see that if we multiply it by P, that means that the this is the direction and we project it onto uh, this image, we'll see that effectively what we get would be just X itself. Uh, because this guy here is M P4 and then we multiply it by M inverse X0. So we can see that this and the M inverse here will cancel off and effectively what we get it would be X plus 0 which is equals to X uh, here. And this means that any point that lies on this line here, this direction over here would be projected to uh, this x, uh, the, this particular point x over here. And the second part over here would be the camera center. And this we have seen earlier on that the camera center is effectively uh, obtained from the null space of PC equals to zero. That means that we can find the null space of P uh, in order to get the camera center. We can also see that this is the end result, the null space of C, by substituting uh, this guy MP4 back into this and we will see that uh, multiplying it by M inverse P4 and 1. This is effectively uh, 0, 0, 0, which satisfy this null space equation over here. Hence, the sum of the two would mean that uh, first I have the camera center here and then I have uh, a, a light ray direction over here and the span of the two will give me all the points that falls on this particular uh, light ray and effectively all these points that falls on the light ray would be reprojected onto uh, X uh, which which is consistent with the camera projection that is given by X equals to PX. Now suppose that we have the location of the 3D point which is given by X equals to XYZ uh, comma T and now the question is that if we were given this 3D point as well as the camera projection matrix, we want to find out that what is the depth of this particular 3D point. That means that given this 3D point X over here, I know the image and then I know the camera projection denoted by P. What I want to find out would be, suppose that this is the camera coordinate frame and this is the Z axis that I'm uh, looking at. So I want to find out this particular depth over here, which I call depth X P. Suppose that I'm given this point X as well as the camera projection matrix. I want to find the depth. That means that the projection of X onto the principal axis Z over here. And I want to find the distance of this projection from the origin of the uh, local camera coordinate, which is also the camera center. This depth here can be uh, effectively computed by taking the sign, the determinant of M, where M is actually the first three by three uh, entry of the P matrix multiplied by W, where W is actually the scale of the projection projected point onto the image, which is this guy over here. So this is actually equals to W, X, Y, and one transpose and uh, divided by T uh, multiplied by the magnitude of the last row of the M matrix. We'll see uh, the proof on why is this true. So, uh, let's look at the illustration, a figure that illustrates the projection of X onto the image. Uh, and this point is actually the projected point, which is equals to P of X over here. Uh, this, this particular point. And C here represents the camera center. So what we are after 
is the distance between C and the projected distance of X onto the principal axis Z. Now, uh, W over here can be co easily computed by the dot product of the third row of X uh, of the camera matrix P and X. So let's see why is this true. If we were to take the camera projection, this would be given by this guy over here. And we know that this is effectively equals to P1 transpose, P2 transpose, and P3 transpose multiplied by X over here. So since small x here is equivalent to wx, wy, as well as w, we can see that this guy here is equal to p1 transpose x, p2 transpose x, and p3 transpose x, where w over here is exactly equals to p3 uh, transpose x, which is this relation that is given here. And uh, x here, can be also further subtracted from uh, the camera matrix, which essentially means that we are going to take this length, the vector that points from C towards X. And we can see that uh, this is true because when we the, the last row of the uh, projection matrix multiplied by X, this is exactly what we have uh, earlier on. And if we take this guy multiplied by C over here, P3 transpose C, this is equals to zero. Since this lives in the null space, uh, it doesn't affect the equation and result of the equation at all. We will still get back uh, W. And what's, but what's interesting here is that we can rewrite the third row of the uh, camera projection matrix into an inhomogeneous uh, form uh, of dot product. And X here, we will take the non-homogeneous form as well. So now uh, we'll ignore the last coordinate of the homogeneous coordinate uh, and call this x tilde. So essentially, x equals to x tilde and 1 transpose. And then uh, it's the same for c. c is equals to c tilde and uh, 1 transpose over here in the homogeneous coordinate. So now we can ignore the last element of the last row in the camera projection matrix. And this thing here is still uh, equivalent to W in this equation over here. Now, we can see that the end result here would be a dot product of the third row of the M matrix multiplied with a non inhomogeneous coordinate of X minus C. And we, we know from the dot product equation where, uh, let's say, I have A dot with B, and we know that this is equal to the magnitude of A multiplied by the magnitude of B and cosine theta, which means that cosine theta is the angle between the vector A and B. This means that well, we can pretty well rewrite this particular dot product into this form over here, where since the dot product is equivalent to W, this is simply M3 transpose dot with uh, this guy over here. And this would be equal to the cosine theta uh, of the angle between the two vectors uh, of m and uh, x minus c, and multiply by the magnitude of these two uh, vectors over here. And notice that we also include the sine of the determinant of m. That's because uh, we have mentioned earlier on that we do not know exactly where this axis is pointing to. It could be pointing in this direction or it could be pointing in the opposite direction. Hence, taking the determinant of m would be equivalent to the signed area. This means that we are taking the vector on the principal plane and then we are crossing it to find out the direction which is equivalent to this guy over here, the direction of the principal axis, whether it's pointing this way as the positive uh, direction or that way in the positive direction. So we are multiplying this by uh, W and effectively the end result that we want to get here would be equivalent to the projection of this guy, which is X tilde minus C tilde over here. This is the distance from C to X and what we want to get here is that the projection by angle theta, which is this guy, and if we were to express this as the subject, this is what we will get. So coming back to the multiplication with the sign of the 
uh, direction of the principal axis. This simply means that we will be able to find out whether this point uh, X is lying in front or behind the camera. So suppose that uh, the sign distance, the, the sign distance of uh, M is pointing this way as the positive direction. And suppose that we are given X over here, which allows us to compute the scale uh, W uh, in the reprojected point. If this X here were to lie in front of the camera, that means that it's going to lie in the same direction as the camera axis, then uh, we know that uh, this would end up to be a positive multiplied by a positive, and it's going to give us a positive direction, a positive depth. This means that X is lying uh, in the same direction as the camera axis. But on the contrary, if my camera axis is pointing the other way. That means that this is negative and I have a positive uh, W over here. If I were to multiply the two together, I will get a negative sign. This means that the, the point, the 3D point is lying in the opposite direction as the camera principal axis. And we can also easily verify this by seeing that if the camera axis is pointing this way and X is lying in this direction, the negative multiplied by negative would give us a positive. And hence, the sign depth of this uh, that we have computed would enable us to check whether the 3D point is lying in the same direction as our uh, principal axis. Now let's look at the decomposition of the camera matrix. So generally, given a camera matrix, what we want to do here is that uh, given this camera matrix, which consists of M, uh, the four factor here. What we want to do here is that we want to do a decomposition because we know that this guy here is equivalent to KR multiplied by I minus R and C. So what we want to do here is that we want to do a decomposition given this particular 3 by 4 matrix here. We want to decompose this into K, R and C. And where K here, we want to further decompose it into F, as well as uh, S and PX and PY, which is our principal uh, point. So uh, given a three by four camera projection matrix, we want to find all the 11 degrees of freedom that is uh, in the intrinsics, as well as the extrinsics of the camera projection matrix. The first thing that, that we want to look at would be how to find the camera center denoted by C over here, where C, the camera center, would lie in the now space of P. So we'll make use of this particular equation here, PC equals to zero, to help us to retrieve the camera center. And this can be easily done. Uh, since we know that this three P here, rewritten into do the rows of uh, the, the three by four matrix over here that is denoted by P1 transpose, P2 transpose, and P3 transpose. And we all know that this guy here, the third guy here, is the principal plane. And we also know that these two guys here are the axis uh, plane. So, so what it means here is that uh, this, this, the intersection, the intersection of these three, of these three planes over here, they are going to all to intersect at the camera center looking at this equation and rewrite P in the form of the three planes, we can see that essentially what we are trying to look at here is that C actually lies at the null space of P, which also means that C is the intersection, is the incidence point of these three uh, planes over here. And this can be easily solved using SVD. We will just apply a SVD on P, which we will get uh, the left octagonal matrix and the singular values as well as the right octagonal matrix and the solution to C would lie in the V octagonal vector that corresponds to the least singular value and uh, we can see that effectively, if you were to work out the math of this uh, SVD, uh, C would be, all the elements in C can be found from this 
uh, equation over here. So now having a look at how to find the camera center, we'll proceed on to look at how to find the remaining parameters in the camera projection uh, matrix, which is essentially uh, the remaining one would be essentially the rotation of the camera as well as the internal uh, parameters, which is the intrinsics, uh, which consists of the focal length, the principal points, as well as the skew uh, factor. We have seen many times in the lecture that we can rewrite this uh, camera matrix into the form of m minus m multiplied by the inhomogeneous coordinate of the camera center. And this is also equivalent to k, which is the intrinsic value, multiplied by r and uh, multiplied by minus r and c. So this guy here is equivalent to the translation, uh, the translation of the camera center. And uh, what's interesting here is that we can see that if we bring k into here to get k multiplied by r, this guy here is essentially equivalent to a 3 by 3 matrix M uh, that is given in decomposition in this particular expression over here. So we can rewrite this into M. And what's even more interesting is that k is actually an upper triangular matrix because this is an intrinsic uh, matrix, internal cam parameter, which consists of the focal length, the principal point, as well as the scale factor. And R here, since it's a rotation matrix, it is also an octagonal matrix. And what this means here is that we, our objective now becomes that uh, we want to decompose the 3x3 three three matrix of M into an upper triangular matrix as well as a octagonal uh, matrix and this can be done using the RQ decomposition of M. So uh, suppose that we are given a uh, matrix M and we want to decompose this into R and Q where R is an upper triangular matrix and Q is an octagon octagonal matrix. We can actually bring it to, over to the left side by simply uh, post multiplying it by the transpose of Q and this would be equals to the upper triangular matrix of R. And since we know R here in the upper triangular part, that there has to be some values. And in the lower triangular part, it has to be zero. In, in, in the case of the camera uh, projection matrix, the last entry here is actually one. So what it means here is that we can actually express this Q since it's a rotation matrix using uh, row pitch and yaw angle. M here is a known value because it's directly from the camera projection matrix. So this would be just three unknowns inside here. And what we can do here is that we can get uh, from here, pre-multiplying this Q transpose by M, we'll get nine, nine equations altogether because it will end up to be a three by three uh, matrix with nine equations. Uh, so nine equations inside here. And where four of the equations would be equals to a known value of zeros and one in this particular case, then uh, we can use make use of these four equations to solve for the three unknowns. In fact, this is an over-determinant equation, or we can just simply make use of the three zeros here to solve for the three unknowns in the, the Euler angle. This is essentially the steps of RQ uh, decomposition. Since in our internal parameters, K over here, the diagonal of this, which is the focal length, it has to be strictly uh, positive. We can also make use of this to add additional constraints to this system of equations when we solve for the unknowns of the Euler angles that is uh, in, in this octagonal matrix over here. And this can be simply easily done. Having solved for R and the internal parameters of rotation and K, the last thing that we need to do would be to recover back all the parameters in the camera intrinsic uh, value. So suppose that we assume that the focal length it is different in the two, two direction, the X and Y direction, and uh, including, uh, and we also include this scale vector over here. So altogether, we would have uh, five unknowns in this. So since we apply a QR decomposition on M, we will be able to retrieve R and K, where R is an octagonal uh, matrix and K is an upper triangular matrix. So we'll be able to directly read off these entries 
all these five unknowns from the upper triangular matrix over here. So far, all the developments of our camera projection matrix is based on Euclidean uh, geometry or Euclidean coordinate system. That's because well, we have seen when we talk about the camera coordinate system, we are talking about the, uh, an Euclidean reference frame. And when we talk about the world frame, we are also making use of the Euclidean linear system. This might seem confusing at this particular time that uh, why is it that everything that we use to describe the camera projection matrix is based on Euclidean geometry, but we insist that camera is actually a projective uh, device which actually maps a P3 space into a P2 space. This can be easily seen by another way of uh, decomposing the, the camera matrix P. We can actually see that this, since this is a 3 by 4 matrix, we can decompose it into a first 3 by 3 element followed by a 3 by 4 matrix and then post multiplying it by a 4 by 4 uh, homography. So uh, the 4 by 4 matrix over here, it would be the action because we can see that uh, when we do a projection, it's actually P equals to uh, X over here. So uh, this means that this guy over here is directly in contact with the uh, 3D space. And uh, when it's in directly in contact with the 3D space, so the 4x4 matrix here could be any projective uh, transformation of 3D space. That means that it can act on this X in a, uh, in a projective uh, transformation manner. And uh, this would be equivalent to everything that we have learned earlier on in lecture 2 and lecture 3, where the operation here with this 4x4 matrix, this is just a uh, transform, transformation matrix uh, which could be proje projective in nature and uh, when it acts on X, uh, this could be equivalent to a P3 space mapping it back onto itself which is also a P3 space and uh, hence this part here would be projective in nature. Then uh, we can see that we can pre-multiply this operation here by a 3x4 matrix and this 3x4 matrix here Notice that it's just simply an identity with the last column here with all zeros entry. And this is equivalent to a projection from a 3D space to a 2D space. So uh, it does nothing. Essentially, there's no transformation here. So what it does here is just simply remove the last dimension from the P3 space and form it into a P2 space. This is the action where we are simply mapping a P3 space into a P2 space. So once uh, all these actions here, so when it's done, we are now essentially living in a, a projective 2D space. And hence, when we're living in a projective 2D space, the last 3x3 three three metric here could act on this space. And this would be simply any form of uh, transformation. In the, it could be also a, a projective transformation or homography. So what it simply means is that I can actually pre-multiplying it by this uh, matrix where up to this uh, action here, I'm already into the P2 space. So if I were to pre-multiply it by this, this guy here, by another homography, I'll be just simply transforming it from uh, an image to another image, which is essentially equals to uh, what we have seen earlier on, H prime equals to H multiplied by X. And this is a, a transformation of a, a, of a P2 space into the P2 space itself. So consequently, the whole operation of the camera projection matrix should be seen as a, as a projective op operation. Now, having looked at the projective uh, cameras where the center of the camera lies in a finite coordinate, let's us now switch our attention to uh, another class of projective cameras where the camera center lies at infinity. So we'll see that uh, the camera or of this type of camera, which we call the affine camera, has the form of uh, this. It's still going to be a 3 by 4 matrix. But now what's interesting here is that the last row uh, of this projection matrix is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. Let's see uh, why is this so. There are two reasons that can explain this phenomena where the last row equals to 0, 0, 0, 1. So let's look at the second uh, reason first. We have seen that uh, earlier on when we talk about the finite 
camera, the projection of the finite camera, that the last row of the projection matrix is equivalent to the principal plane. So if I have uh, this guy over here, which is my camera center, this principal plane here is going to be given by P3 transpose. And in the case of the finite camera, uh, C as well as the principal plane is going to have a finite value. But in the case of a affine camera, this plane as well as the camera center, they are going to be lying on the plane at infinity. And this is why the principal plane, which is given by P3 transpose over here, has to be on the plane at infinity which is given by this guy here, 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, we can also see that since C here has to be on the principal plane, and it has also got to be in uh, lying on the plane at infinity, uh, what this means is that C now becomes an ideal point, uh, which we conveniently denote as uh, D0 transpose, where D is simply a directional vector that points towards the direction of the camera uh, matrix. We can see that this uh, D here, the directional vector of the camera center at infinity, it can be obtained from the now space of, the, uh, of this equation. Previously, we talked about the camera matrix, it can be rewritten into this way, where M here is a 3 by 3 matrix. So M2 by 3 is simply the first two rows of uh, a matrix that is formed by the first two rows of the uh, of this M matrix. And we can solve for the now space of uh, D here. So the reason why this is true is because we can see that uh, if D here equals to the now space of uh, this guy, M2 by 3 multiplied by D equals to 0, then substituting it back onto this equation over here, we will get uh, 0. We can easily see this. So PC here equals to MP4. So if we were to multiply this by D and 0 over here, we can see since the last row of this guy, we said that it has to be equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So the last row is always equals to 0. And the now we are remaining with the first two rows. So uh, the first two multiplied by D. This will be equivalent to M2 by 3 multiplied by D. The, the, the first two entries of the projection matrix over here, uh, if we were to uh, multiply it by 0, what we will get here is two zeros over here. So since we have this M2 by 3 multiplied by D, which we define as D to be the now space of the M2 by 3 matrix. So this guy here is essentially also equals to 0. Hence, we get uh, a 0 over here. That means that we have proven the this relation PC equals to 0 uh, to be true. Because the last entry here of the projection matrix uh, is equals to 0, 0, 0, 1, we can see that the M matrix, which is given by the first 3, ele three by 3 uh, elements of the entries of the projection matrix, it's going to be singular because the last row here is zero. So that means that uh, we only have two linearly uh, independent uh, entries in our M matrix. So the affine camera can also be decomposed into uh, this particular form over here uh, because the projection equation is x equals to px over here. The, the first four by four uh, transformation would have to act on x. And we'll see later that this particular guy over here, when it acts on x, is always going to be a fine uh, transformation. And now, uh, the, the, the simple reason is because a point at infinity, uh, after this operation by PA, it will still remain at infinity. Hence, this guy here is an affine uh, camera. So the difference, be besides having this uh, 4x4 matrix as a affine transformation instead of a projective transformation, the other difference would be the, this particular projection matrix that brings a point from the 3D space into a uh, 2D space. So instead of having... Uh, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 0 at the last column. This, this is a projective projection from a 3D space to a 2D space. Now we can see that the zero, the columns of 0 is swapped into the, uh, the, the third and the fourth column are swapped 
uh, from the projection projective uh, into a octographic uh, projection over here. Then finally, when we after we uh, have done this projection that converts the 3D point into a 2D uh, point, we can apply any affine transformation on this 2D point by simply pre-multiplying it with a 3 by 3 affine uh, transformation matrix over here. Instead of writing the P matrix just solely as a 3 by 4 uh, matrix with the last row as 0, 0, 0, 1, we can also decompose this particular projection matrix into the same form as what we have seen uh, in the projective camera. So there will be a the, the first uh, matrix here would be 4 by 4 and this is essentially the rigid transformation. The rigid uh, transformation which is given by R and T and then followed by uh, this 3 by 4 matrix here which is the orthographic projection and then uh, finally we have a 3 by 3 uh, calibration matrix which is the, in the similar format as our intrinsic value and extrinsic value in our uh, projective matrix. So we can also see that uh, this calibration matrix, the intrinsic uh, uh, matrix, can be uh, expressed into the scaling factor as well as the skew factor and the principal point. Because this rotation matrix here is actually a uh, 3 by 3 matrix which consists of R1 transpose, R2 transpose and R3 transpose. So by multiplying it with this orthographic because the third column here is 0, we can see that the effective result is that we are removing the third row of R and then putting it here. We're putting the first two rows of R here. Similarly, the effect will act on T which consists of Tx ty and tz so effectively what it's trying to do here is that is remove the last entry of t where only tx and ty remains uh, here so it's a standard practice or it's uh, commonly found in the literature that uh, people just conveniently set the principal point to zero the reason is because the this is a affine transformation and there won't be any projective distortion in the in the image so it's uh, it would be more convenient to just center the principal point on the centroid of the scene this is because uh, there won't be any uh, projective uh, distortion and here zero hat transpose is simply just a, a row of zero and zero after we have seen all the uh, the decomposition of uh, the affine camera matrix into the intrinsics and the extrinsics uh, values, we can see that it, all together there are 8 degrees of freedom in comparison with the 11 degrees of, uh, contrast this to the 11 degrees of freedom for a projective camera. So there are only 8 degrees of freedom that corresponds to the all the non-zeros and non-unit uh, metric elements. So uh, essentially, there are 3 uh, degrees of freedom from the intrinsics and then there's another 3 from the rotation so three here another three here and finally there's two degrees of freedom uh, from t1 and t2 so you might be wondering uh, why is that that uh, the original rotation matrix which is r1 transpose r2 transpose and r3 transpose this has three degrees of freedom why is it that when i remove the last row I will still end up with uh, three degrees of freedom by just considering the, the uh, first two rows. The reason is very simple because the the first three the three rows in the rotation matrix they are actually not linearly independent. This is because R three transpose is simply equals to the cross product of the first two uh, row. So this means that any two rows in the rotation matrix would already contain all the necessary uh, three degrees of freedom. So if we were to multiply this out and express the P matrix, the uh, projection matrix into uh, this form that we have seen earlier on, we can also easily see that there are eight degrees of freedom here because they are all together eight non-zero and non-unit matrix elements. And uh, the last row here is uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, which is fixed, 
what this means is that we only essentially have two linearly independent rows and now PA over here uh, camera projection matrix would essentially only have rank of two because this is uh, rank deficient and uh, com contrast this with our projection matrix the the projective uh, in the projective camera MP over here uh, the rank of this guy over here is going to be three here's uh, some proofs to show that uh, a fine property of the camera at infinity so basically uh, there are two points that we should note over here and these two points actually is referring to the same thing so uh, as we have seen earlier on after applying a fine transformation on any entity on any point in space or there's a certain property that is invariant to this uh, affine transformation so one of them is actually uh, a point of infin at infinity when we uh, transform it by a affine transformation this is going to still remain at the uh, point of at infinity or even a plane at infinity it's going to also be uh, mapped to uh, points at infinity on an image because uh, we are talking about the 3D space uh, mapping onto a 2D space. So this can be easily shown by computing this guy here. Uh, this is our camera projection matrix, the affine camera projection matrix. And if we were to multiply it by an ideal point that is sitting at the plane at infinity. So this guy here is my uh, at the plane of infinity. And I have a point here which is represented by X, Y, Z, zero the last entry here has to be zero because it's a point at infinity i'll see that after the undergoing the affine transformation this guy is going to map into x y zero on the image space so it will not be found on the image this is because this is zero it will be somewhere it will be at, lying at infinity and uh the last entry here which is zero uh, the, because the last row of this guy is zero 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 one hence you will all when you take zero 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 one multiplied by this guy here is always going to be zero now we have shown that the affine camera projection uh matrix is invariant to a point at infinity and hence this uh must be a, a fine uh transformation we can also see that uh Parallel lines in the world are also projected to parallel lines in, in, in the image. And this is also another uh, property of an affine transformation because affine transformation preserves the parallelism of any lines or any planes. So uh, we, can, we can easily uh, think of it this way that parallel lines in the world. So if I have two parallel lines, they are both going to intersect at a point but this point is going to be at the plane sitting on the plane at infinity this point uh, is going to be an ideal point which can be also conveniently represented as x y z and zero transpose over here so now if we were to apply this uh, the intersection of this parallel line and then pre-multiplying it by the projection matrix that means that i'm going to project this point onto my image over here we can pretty well see that from the first proof over here that this point is also going to lie at infinity this point is going to lie at x y and zero so what this means is that two parallel lines when they are projected by a, a fine transformation uh, a, a fine projection matrix onto an image the point where they meet is also going to be at infinity hence these two lines after projection they must also be parallel so this means that the p of a over here our affine camera transformation matrix indeed preserves the affine property so there are several different types of uh, affine cameras uh, let's just look through the several uh, popular types uh, of affine camera the first type would be what we call the octographic uh, projection this is the case where the same object is being mapped onto the image without any change in the scale, without any scaling. So this would be just uh, simply removing the Z direction, the depth of the, of the object, and we will project it onto that, uh, that image over here. So uh, another uh, interesting point to note here is that every point correspondence, the ray that, the light ray that, uh, that joins the point correspondence they are all parallel to each other and of course 
the camera center because if we were to extend this light ray uh, the camera center will actually converge they will actually converge at the plane at infinity and uh, this shows that this guy here is actually an affine camera uh, which fulfills our property that the camera center must be at uh, the plane at infinity and uh, what's interesting here is that this projection ignores the depth altogether because we can see that it doesn't matter whether this person is here, here, or here. The depth doesn't matter anymore uh, because at all this location, it will always project to the same person. And mathematically, we can uh, write this into this form. So essentially, what we are doing here is that we are ignoring the first part here, the K matrix over here, the intrinsics. This is because the K matrix consists of a scaling factor, which will scale the projection onto the image. But since we say that orthographic projection has no scaling effect, so now this guy here is essentially equals to identity. And what remains will be the orthographic projection matrix, as well as the rigid transformation matrix. And essentially, we will be able to get this three by four matrix over here where uh, the same thing the last row is still going to be 0001 now uh, orthographic projection has altogether five degrees of freedom because we, we ignore the first three by three uh, matrix over here the k matrix over here which essentially consists of uh, additional three degrees of freedom uh, where there's alpha x alpha y and s so since this is ignored, we all together, we would have eight minus uh, three and we are left with five degrees of freedom over here, which we can easily see from here too. Uh, R1 and R2, there's all together three degrees of freedom and T1 and T2, there's all together two degrees of freedom. So adding this two up, we'll get five degrees of uh, freedom. And uh, now there's also other constraints in the M matrix, which is uh, th the first two by three entries in the projection matrix. So this always has a, uh, so sorry, this is the first uh, three by three entries in the camera projection matrix, that where the last row is always zero and the first two rows are octagonal. And then uh, it should also be a unit norm because these are the entries in the rotation matrix. And the last, T3 over here should always be 1. So another form of uh, a fine camera projection is what we call the scale orthographic projection. This is essentially a two-step process where in the first step, we will just simply map the object onto a virtual image plane, first using orthographic projection. So this means that there's no scale change. And because uh, we have a scale here. This is scale orthographic projection. So uh, after applying the orthographic projection, we would have to apply a scaling on this orthographic projection. And we can see that the image of the person actually becomes uh, smaller or it could also become, uh, uh, I mean, it, it could also become bigger, but in this case, it uh, becomes uh, smaller. So uh, essentially, it's a two-step process. The first is an orthographic projection followed by a perspective uh, projection, which is uh, acted upon by the scaling effect. So this means that uh, this also tells you the hint that uh, it should be first the orthographic projection, which is what we have seen uh, earlier on. And then uh, since this is a scale orthographic projection, we will have to multiply it by a scale. So notice that in this case here, scale uh, orthographic projection, the definition is that we have to scale the object by the same amount in both directions. Hence, K over here, the scaling factor over here has to be equal in the in both direction and there won't be a skew uh, factor over here so altogether we would have six degrees of freedom uh, five uh, degrees of freedom from the orthographic projection which i have seen earlier on and one additional one for k so altogether we will get uh, six degree of freedom some characteristic of the scale orthographic projection matrix is that 
the M matrix has last row of zero, which is the same as octographic projection, where the first two rows are octagonal and equal norm, but the now T3 is no longer uh, equals to one, it's, it's equals to one over K over here. And the third type of uh, a fine camera that we can find, it's uh, what we call the weak perspective projection. So the this is similar to scale octographic projection, except for one difference is that the, instead of scaling the same amount uh, in both directions over here, where there's one single constant of K over here, what we are doing here is that we are going to scale it differently by a different amount. And we are going to say that this is uh, in the X direction, we are going to scale by alpha X in the Y direction, we are going to scale by alpha Y. And effectively, this part here remains the same, which is the orthographic projection. In addition to the five degrees of freedom from the orthographic projection, we have two additional degrees of freedom from the scaling factor. So altogether, we would have seven degrees of uh, freedom to our weak perspective projection. And the projection matrix is now characterized by the last row has to be zero, and the first two row has to be octagonal and there's no need for equal norm. That's because of the scaling from both uh, different directions.